is my privilege to be with you tonight. Thank you for being with us. To the, those that are with us on a, in a virtual capacity, thank you for being here as well uh, this evening. Uh, you might wonder, Tennessee welcomes you. That's what the, um, the slide says. We're not going to show everyone the slide because I want you to take this address down. If our computer cooperates, which it's not wanting to do, let me try this while uh, to see if that helps it a little bit. There we go. Uh, please write that address down. L.A., uh, Brandon and I made some visits this afternoon, and we um, met this individual, and uh, this individual expressed interest uh, in the church, and they have recently moved uh, to our area, and so we want you to send them a welcome to the area card, an invitation uh, to come and to be with us. And uh, so I'll give you just a few moments while uh, you write that down and want to encourage you to be here next week when our evangelism seminar begins. It's kind of like a gospel meeting in December. You know, the old song, the Christmas carol said it's the most wonderful time of the year. Well, anytime you can be together with God's people to study his word and even to learn more effectively how to share that word. Well, that's a wonderful time of year. And it just happens that uh, this particular event will be held uh, next Sunday through Wednesday. The same schedule that we follow for a gospel meeting typically we will use for this evangelism seminar. And so we hope that you uh, can come and uh, enjoy that time of study and fellowship and worship together. I've spoken with Brother Rob and uh, he and uh, Sister Nicole and the rest of their family. Uh, they're anxiously uh, looking forward to this time uh, to be together and we are as well. So uh, please make sure you attend that. Hope you've had enough time to write that down. If you've not, uh, please see me afterward and we'll uh, get that information to you. And we'll try to do more of this. As Brandon mentioned this morning, uh, if you know of an individual that's in need, and especially we're thinking of people dealing with sickness or maybe a loss in their family or some other setback, uh, some way that we just as God's people here can show them our love and concern, let us know that. And the truth is, uh, the old adage, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, uh, that's largely true. And so we want to show people that we care and we want to care for them not just with physical needs, although those are very important. But we want to care for them in a spiritual way. And maybe we can do both. So uh, please help us do that more effectively. So uh, thank you for your help in that way. Tonight is question and answer night, the fourth Sunday night of the month. And uh, if you're joining us uh, tonight for the first time, maybe online or by conference call or even visiting, uh, you might w uh, wonder, well, what's the big deal about questions and answers? The Bible is filled with them. And in fact, we see Jesus, God's Son, while here on earth, often asking uh, questions of people. And usually, uh, not always, but he's asking a question sometimes in response to the question that they ask him first. Now, that's where he has the advantage over me. I don't get to ask you a question after you ask me the question first. I wish I could sometimes, but I don't. Instead, my task is simply with God's word as our guide, provide you with a Bible answer. Now, be clear in understanding this. This is not an official, if you want to call it a Church of Christ position. We want to give Bible answers. And so when the question is asked, can we go to Scripture to find that answer? If you uh, determine that based on what the question was and the answer given from God's Word, that it corresponds, then you take that answer as God's Word provides us guidance in that matter. If you don't feel like that was done, then please see me or ask me for further cl clarification or correction. I'll be happy to make that uh, as well. So that's what we want to you uh, to do tonight. Using God's word as our guide, it is our authority. And uh, so whatever answer we want to give is, again, the answer that God gives us himself in his word. So let's begin tonight. Uh, here's the first question submitted. And if you want to submit a question, email it to me. Put it in the little box in the foyer. Call Sonia. She'll take it down. You don't have to give your name. You don't have to... Be concerned if it's a question that you might think is trivial or elemental, uh, elementary, that other people and everyone will know it and they'll think I'm foolish for asking. Please don't let that stop you. If I've ever been less than gracious or kind in answering a question, that's not been my intent. I've never meant to belittle or demean or insult anyone with any of these answers to any of these questions. And if I do that, please, again, uh, tell me that and I'll make a quick and speedy uh, correction, I assure you, and repent and seek forgiveness. But here's the first question submitted to us for tonight. Is it wrong to use by words? And then these were offered as those sorts of by words. Gosh, golly, shucks, others. Why would Christians want to use such? Or is it okay? 
Now that word that they use word there by words, you can use other terms. You could use uh, slang words, for instance, or uh, you could use euphemisms. Those are literary devices. A slang is just an informal word, sometimes standing for something else. A euphemism in our language is just uh, a, an expression used to sometimes soften uh, the seriousness and the easy way to illustrate this that we're all familiar with. Uh, the technical way that we speak in the industry, because I was in the industry, uh, is at the time of death, we speak of the time that someone expired. Now that sounds harsh, doesn't it? And I know that we have families right now dealing with death. And so to say that their loved one expired, that sounds cold and harsh. We use an euphemism. We say that they passed away. In fact, the last time I collected these and assorted euphemisms for death, that numbered close to 100. 100 different ways to say that instead of saying someone died or they expired, they passed away. They bought the farm, they kicked the bucket, they're pushing up daisies, they whatever. Some of these are a little bit humorous, and again, I don't mean to make light of any of these. If you say someone took on room temperature, for instance, that's not something to laugh about, I realize. But these are bywords, these are slang terms, these are euphemisms. Should a Christian use them? That's what the questioner is asking tonight. Clearly, we know uh, that when it relates to what in our language is called profanity, the Bible never mentions that word, profanity, or uh, curse words, or even more familiar as it was taught to me as a little guy, don't use dirty words, as they were called. Don't do that. Well, what are those expressions or what are those words that might stand for something else? I don't remember. I'm sure I picked it up from one of my little classmates, and it was probably just in kindergarten or first grade uh, that I picked up one of these words and I went and as I've told you many times before the influence of my mother's mother my grandmother uh, was so very great and remains so in my life but in her hearing I said gee whiz and I had to pick up several teeth after I said that no she didn't knock my teeth out but she gave me a good knock on the head I thought it was something similar to what mom put on broccoli to make it edible cheese whiz if you don't remember what cheese whiz is, it's just melted plastic that they put yellow food color in. But that's another discussion and question for another night in time. But she said, you don't say that. And I said, why not? Well, that's misusing God's name. And my little brain, you know, got to working and said, I've not read it in there. Now, I've not read it cover to cover like you have, Granny. But I don't remember God going by that name in Scripture. But for her, that term of course, represented a misuse of the name of God, a, an expression that stood for something else. And the examples that I've just given for some people, they would say it stands for something else and thus shouldn't be used. But here's where I would maybe caution you. If you were to ask, and I've done this, I've not done it with our young people here, but I have in the last five years done this. I did it in a camp setting, just a kind of an experiment of sorts. If you were to ask most young people under the age of 20, to read from the King James Version of the Bible and you get over to about Genesis chapter 12 and it begins to enumerate the animals that Abraham and his wealth possessed. There is a certain animal used by the King James translators uh, that those people that are age 20 and under find very offensive. And they say, I can't believe that's in the Bible. You know the word I'm talking about. We use the newer version. We say a female or a male donkey. But they find it so crude that another word is used. But again, in that time period, uh, there was not any thought given to the idea that that term could be used in that way to refer to that particular animal. Now, I just give you that as an illustration to show that over time, things like this change in language. Now, certainly, anyone that would use a substitute word but still mean whatever it is behind the term... Uh, a Christian has no part in doing that. Uh, whatever type of profanity or expletive or vulgar or offensive sort of thing like that, we should avoid. We should avoid. Now, uh, to give us some guidance in this matter, Jesus in Matthew chapter 5 makes an interesting statement. And really still today, we don't know exactly the full 
import, maybe, of what he had to say, although the context seems to suggest it was just the way that they would speak in the first century world. When he says in verse 36, Matthew chapter 5, Do not swear by your head. You cannot make hair, one hair white or black. And then he says in verse 37, Let your yes be yes, and your no, no, for whatever is more than these is from the evil one. There's not an exact parallel with this sort of uh, thought that the questioner is mentioning, but I think there is something here. Jesus said in our language, in our speech, uh, it should be such that we don't have to add things in, so to speak. These were people uh, who, when they made some oath or an agreement, either with another individual or maybe even with God, would have to add something to it. And you've used, well, maybe you've not used, I don't know that I have, but you've heard it used. Some people say, well, I promise on a stack of Bibles... Or I promise, or some people even say I affirm, or I swear on my mother's grave, for instance. You hear that on television, you've seen it on movies, maybe in conversation with other people. They've said something like that. In other words, you can really take my word to heart. I really mean what I'm saying. Jesus said if you're a person of integrity, if you're a follower of God, your speech should be so upstanding and your character uh, so well known that when you say yes, that means you'll do it. No questions asked, no further modification is needed. If you say no, that's what it means. Now in Matthew 12, again, Jesus is your speaker. And he says, beginning in verse 33, make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. A tree is known by its fruit. Well, is he interested just in you know, the horticulture aspect of life. No, that's not what he's talking about. He's telling us that creation parallels people, or better said, maybe people parallel creation in the natural world. Brood of vipers, how can you, Jesus is asking, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you, now listen to Jesus. This is Matthew 12, verse 36. Jesus said, but I say to you that for every idle word men shall speak, or men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Jesus is telling us, if he's telling us anything, we ought to take what we say very seriously. And we must not just flippantly use language. Is that easy to do? It is for some of us. And I'll admit I've been guilty of that. And uh, maybe it was just, you know, growing up and being around uh, others my age uh, that did that. Maybe even some adults influenced me in a negative way. I can be loose sometimes in that way. And I, I've tried to improve in that area of my life. I want to do what Paul says in Ephesians 4 verse 25 and following. Put away lying. Let each of you speak truth with his neighbor. We're members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. That would certainly apply here. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Do not give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Now verse 29, let no corrupt. We talked about this in our marriage class this morning in our discussions and conversations with our spouse. A corrupt word rots. It decays, it putrefies, it's a very strong term. Paul said, no corrupt word should proceed out of your mouth, whether you're speaking to your spouse or anyone else for that matter, but what is good for necessary edification to build up instead of to tear down, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Verse 31, let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking. Seems to be a catch word of sorts. Paul said, all of that be put away from you with all malice. Don't have the intent to hurt others no matter what. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. So, is it wrong to use by words? Again, it may be that an individual is saying something without knowing any significance back of that term. In that sense, I would not find an ability to, uh, you know, assign fault to that person. If you say, well, you know, 500 years ago that meant this, it's unlikely that I know maybe what that meant 500 years ago. But at the same time, as I grow and as I mature as a Christian, the ideal that Jesus set forth, say yes or say no, as Paul says, only say things that build up, that is not corrupt or decaying or tearing down others, that ought to be my goal. And knowing that I will be judged by my words, as Jesus said, it means I should think very carefully and very clearly and then speak. James says in James 1.19, be swift to hear, that is, 
Listen quickly, but speak slowly. A lot of us kind of get that mixed up. Now, uh, are there other ways that we can go with this? Yes, uh, the questioner is not asking, but I would warn you, this is more for our younger folks. They may say, well, those older people, they're just prudes. They don't like things like that. Be aware of how even your actions, for instance, all of um, and all of us, regardless of our age, but especially a lot of them like to use their talking with these, with their thumbs on their electronic device or with the rest of their fingers if they're typing out on a full keyboard. And when you're texting, when you're posting on social media and you use acronyms like the letters O-M-G, you need to be aware of what that conveys. And how that would be, in my estimation, a violation of Exodus chapter 20 where God said, My name is holy. Do not use my name in vain. You see all of the applications of this. They are many and varied, aren't they? Recently, I've been noticing a trend. And uh, one individual in particular, uh, it, it was called to his attention. He's not here, but a Christian in another place. And to his credit, he understood then and backed down from this particular practice. But as it relates to our current president. There are words associated with him. If I was trying to cheer on Brother Savage at a softball game, I couldn't say it without someone assuming that I was denigrating our president. Now you say, what in the world are you talking about? If you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, then maybe you've been living under a rock. But if I'm saying, let's go, Brandon, and then I uh, am saying that again to denigrate our president, I'm not doing what First Timothy 2 tells me to do to pray for that man knowing especially what those who use that sort of euphemism are meaning by. So our speech, I'll leave you as we leave this. Would, would Christians use this? Should they? Be very aware that out of all the ways that people judge us, and people judge you every day, you say, well, that's not fair. It may not be, but you do too. We judge people every day. We judge them by uh, their appearance. We judge them by their height, their weight, uh, their hair or lack thereof. We judge them by their clothing. Uh, all of that, uh, outwardly, we just make estimations and judgments. And one of the, I suppose, and I would suggest to you, most profound ways that people judge us is by our speech. What we say, and not only just what we say, but how we say it. And I can tell you, and I think I've told you before, one of my... Uh, very sad incidents from when I was much younger, a freshman in high school, playing in a basketball gym and letting a word that uh, those who profess to be followers of Jesus should not say escape from my lips. And someone in commentary, as they ran back down court, said, I thought you were a Christian. And that haunts me still to this day, not knowing that individual, not knowing uh, the bad impression I left with them, not knowing if uh, whenever... If my name were to ever cross their mind or my memory, if that thought and that memory might remain. I pray not and that I was able to in some way make amends and show them differently. But do people wonder when they hear you talk, when they hear you say, and not just what you say, but even how you say it or the words that you use, I thought she was a Christian. I thought he was a Christian. May by our words we never be questioned in that manner. So hopefully that's an answer to uh, that particular question this evening. Question two, is a legal recognition of marriage required to be a marriage in the eyes of God? Is what makes a marriage a marriage in God's eyes, the legality of it, or more the ceremony side and recognition by your community and peers? It's basically the same question as you can see, but uh, what makes a marriage a marriage? Well, that's a good question. Uh, is it uh, that we covenant with uh, the state laws uh, where we live, and state laws vary from state to state in our United States of America. If we were outside of this country, would we be under another uh, jurisdiction, or does it just matter uh, what God says about it? Well, let's think about that. What makes a marriage legal? First of all, uh, we find in Genesis chapter 2, and you can turn over there, you know it's there, the origination for marriage. There's no ceremony recorded in Genesis chapter 2 other than... Um, I, I, and this has always uh, intrigued me. You know, what did, how did God pitch the idea? How did God pitch the idea as all of the animals are brought to Adam and he names them? And the Bible says it's not good to, for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper for him. And Adam sees that all of the animals had a companion that is a male and a female. And he did not have one comparable to him. And of course, the old joke is God says, I'll give you a wonderful partner. It'll cost you an arm and a leg. And he said, what can I get for a rib, right? 
that's funny, yeah, I laugh, ha ha. But uh, I know I don't mean to be insulting ladies, but you know, how did God, what did he do? What did he say? Or did God just, you know, snap his fingers and the deep sleep come upon Adam? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us those explicit details. But under divine anesthesia, as it were, Adam slept. God performed his surgery, took the rib, closed up the flesh in its place, made woman out of man. That's literally what woman means. Brings her to Adam. Verse 23, I always like to read it at weddings. Adam says, wow, this is what I've been looking for. That's the Hebrew import, actually, of his words. Flesh of my flesh, she'll be called woman, she was taken out of man. Finally, there was not another animal that looked like that. That's what I've been looking for. He finally found a helper, a uh, one to compliment him. And that's what Eve was. And thus we have husband and wife, we have man and woman, we have two joined together, glued together, cleaved together. They become one flesh. That's not just a physical um uh, Idea that's not related or restricted only to that part uh, of our biological anatomy that that one flesh relationship occurs, but it involves the totality of their very beings. And so it's a beautiful image of what marriage is to be. Now, again, there's no ceremony of sorts. There's no courthouse to go to and get a license from. Uh, Matthew Henry, if you want to read this, uh, Amy's daddy read it at our uh, wedding ceremony has a beautiful, eloquent, poetic description. You know, uh, the twilight stars form the candelabra and the nightingales uh, sing, you know, the wedding hymn or, what, you know, all of that. Did it happen that way? I don't know. Maybe it did. But we're not told. God joined them together. Now, of interest, you keep reading through Scripture. And how does marriage occur? All that we see is that the man says, you know, that's the woman I want. Sometimes there was an exchange of goods, a dowry of sorts. Uh, you can read about Isaac uh, being found a bride for him and then uh, his sons. Uh, so we don't know. So what, what do we know about marriage? Well, what we know about marriage is if God originated it, uh, fundamentally, number one, He as the Creator provides the rules to govern it. And what God says marriage is, that's what it must be. It cannot be more or different than that. Consequently, today, ideas where two members of the same sex, two males or two females, try to join themselves in marriage, it can never be done. And before someone said, no, 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 wait a minute, there's a law on the books now. The Supreme Court said it could be done. It doesn't matter. The court of heaven has said long ago, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, a man and a woman. There'll never be gay marriage, quote unquote. It's a misuse of the term. Because God did not define marriage in that way as between two members of the same sex. So there'll never be any sort of thing like that. We have these ordinances from God. Now, today you might say, well, should we seek any legal recognition? Or is it enough to just say that in the sight of God, I've chosen her and she's chosen me and we are covenanting Covenant, we're making an agreement. We're calling God as witness uh, to bind us together and we make a promise to be husband and wife to each other as the uh, instructions of Scripture give us. And that's what we are. Could I do that? Could you do that? You could do that. Uh, the questioner also asked, I didn't put on uh, here the slide. What about, for instance, in the uh, antebellum period when slaves were treated as property and African Americans were not permitted to marry and yet on those plantations, there were males and females who became husband and wife. And they agreed in the sight of God to have that relationship with one another. Did God recognize that? I would say yes, He did. Even though the state, even though the country did not. Because they had made that agreement in the sight of God. You see, uh, that legal recognition uh, doesn't really matter. Now, does that mean we should not seek that legal uh, guidance or that legal, if you want to even call it permission, I don't think so. Romans chapter 13 tells us that government is issued or it is ordained by God uh, to provide order in society. And so as much as uh, God rules in the kingdoms of men, Daniel chapter 4 verse 25, Nebuchadnezzar had to learn that lesson, lesson rather. So in man's laws do not contradict God's laws as citizens of this earthly kingdom, this country that we live in, we ought to abide by its laws as well. Uh, that's kind of the easy answer. If a conflict exists, God's law always has the order of priority. Always. Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Peter and John were told it's against the law to preach about Jesus. 
That's basically what they were told. The Sanhedrin speaking not just for the Jewish court system, but also having, if you will, the rubber stamp of Roman authority. Don't preach any more about Jesus. You remember what Peter said? Oh, well, okay, we'll quit. No, that's not what he said. He said, we will obey God rather than men. And that's still what we must do today. Now, uh, this question, it has other little, I guess, offshoots from it. For instance, God's law is supreme no matter how marriage may be redefined. We talked about that. God's law is supreme, especially even about the dissolving of marriage and what constitutes acceptable uh, grounds for divorce, for instance. And so this is an area that will be, I think, a continual battleground in the years ahead. We have to understand that God has a standard. He has a plan, and we must abide by it. Uh, what makes a marriage? Uh, does it require recognition from the government? If I live under a government where that law can be obeyed and also still obey the laws of God, then I would say, yes, do that. Are there maybe some unusual circumstances where throughout history or just again the old proverbial, if you and some other person land on a deserted island, and she agrees to be your wife, and uh, you're both eligible to be married. Could you be married in the sight of God? Yeah, uh, that would probably be okay as well. But those scenarios are, again, few and far between. We make vows and promises. We covenant before God. That's what makes the marriage binding. So uh, the legality of it, yes, uh, the law is required and should be obeyed when it does not conflict with God's law, but God's law must be honored as supreme. Maybe that's not too convoluted. Hope uh, you get the answer of that fairly easily. Last question for you tonight. And you can say, ah, oh, if you want to. Uh, cute little guy uh, there. Is Satan, questioner asked, omnipresent like God, or is he just roaming about? And then the same questioner asked as a follow-up in Revelation 12, verse 10, we read the phrase, quote, accuser of our brethren, end quote. Is this referring to Satan? If so, why is this description used? Let's answer the first question first. Is Satan omnipresent like God? Well, what does it mean to be omnipresent? Omni means all or total. And we use it as a prefix when we attach it to words like present, meaning God is totally present. He's everywhere, has access to everything at all times. He is omniscient. The word looks like omniscience. That is, he knows all that there is to know, God knows. He's never learned anything because he, he's always known everything. Uh, God is omnibenevolent. He is good, totally good. Uh, there is no definition of good apart from God. He is the very, uh, the very definition, the essence of what is good. So when he is present... We are talking about that there is not a place where God cannot see. There is not a place where God does not know. Uh, Psalm 139, verses 7 to 12, in poetic fashion, the psalmist said, if I go, here's the way I would kind of summarize it, paraphrasing. If I go to the highest mountain, I'd find God there. If I were to go to the lowest part of the sea, wherever that is, I think the Mariana Trench now, somewhere deeper than Mount Everest. If you can imagine flipping Mount Everest up and putting it in the ocean, the Mariana Trench is even deeper than that, uh, you know, miles and miles deep into the ocean. If I were able to go that deep down, what would I find? God's there too. If I try to hide myself in the dark, to God it's just like the noonday sun. In other words, I cannot flee from God's presence. A simpler verse, Proverbs 15, verse 3, the eyes of the Lord, even though He doesn't have eyes like these, uh, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. So God is everywhere at all times. Is Satan like that? And the simple answer is no, he is not. For if he were, then he would be equal to God. But he does not possess that divine nature. He does not possess those infinite attributes uh, like God does. He is not eternal. He is not uncreated. I know that's kind of a big can of worms that maybe some of you want to jump into. I'm not tonight. But the devil is a created being. Else, if he were not a created being, he would be co-equal with God because God is eternal. Now, the idea that dualism, and that's the proverbial good versus evil that's found in a lot of not just mythology, but even in some world religions, uh, the idea of light and darkness, all of those things set in contrast to each other is not biblical. Good and evil are not in a fight to see who will ultimately win in the sense that that... Uh, Final victory is in doubt or jeopardy or uncertain at this time. God wins, folks. God wins. Jesus has already won. The question is only if I will win with him by doing as he said. Uh, there's not some cosmic dualism that will continue on, uh, you know, for as long as creation lasts. And maybe good will come out on top. Maybe evil will win. Who knows? 
It's not biblical at all. So the devil is not omnipresent like God. He does not possess that infinite attribute. Does he just roam about? It seems that he does. Now again, you say, how do I understand that? I don't know other than Luke 4 verse 13 tells me that when Satan, the devil, had tempted Jesus and ended those temptations, he departed from him. That seems to be, at least in my understanding, uh, an understanding that there was a location where Jesus was and the devil left him from that location and went somewhere else. Now, uh, the Bible says he did depart, but until an opportune time he returned. 1 Peter 5 and verse 8 says that we are to be sober and be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, you remember, he walks about like a roaring lion. And that word for walks about would probably be better translated, he prowls, he stalks. If you've ever uh, watched, uh, even your house cat will do that sometimes if they're out in the yard trying to sneak up on a bird. Uh, Brother Corey's telling me about seeing a bobcat yesterday morning out in the wild. Uh, you can watch the nature programs, you know, uh, as an animal sneaks up on its prey. It wants, of course, uh, the other animal that it's going to be attacked to be unaware, to be careless, not paying attention. And then he swoops in, of course, for the attack. The devil does that. That's scary, folks, isn't it? It should get our attention. That's what Peter wants us to understand. Be sober, be vigilant, be on the lookout. Live the uh, Christian life with intentionality. And so he does wonder about. Now, how he does that, what means he uses those that work with him in that task, those are many and varied. And what I want you to see, now you say, why throw up a picture like this? Here's our tendency. And hopefully you've seen it already in the comments I've made. Either we view the devil as being equal with God and so powerful that we're at his mercy. And at any time, he can just overwhelm us and destroy us. That's not biblical. I'll say that more about that in a moment. Or we go to the other extreme. We say, the devil, what are you talking about? Man, there's no devil out there. We just, you know, this little cute baby, that's, uh, he's a little devil. That's what it is. No, there is a real being. And he is wicked and he is vile. And he is very powerful indeed. Not equal to God, but powerful nonetheless. And he wants nothing more to destroy you. He knows he's going to hell and he wants you to go right along with him. And so many will sadly do just that. Now, how does that relate to the second question? Revelation 12, if you'll turn over there. Of course, the book of Revelation filled with figurative language, so we have to keep that in mind. But as John writes in verse 10, he writes saying that he heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for, the reason why, for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. Is that a reference to the devil? And I would say, in fact, that I believe that it is. Well, why would you say that? If you go back to the Old Testament, near the end of your, or rather, excuse me, if you go back to the Old Testament, near the end of the Old Testament, before you get to the New, you will find the little minor prophet Zechariah. We don't study it very often, and tonight I can't give you the full background of all that Zechariah was dealing with. But tonight, intriguing to me, is chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Listen to it, please. The Bible says, He showed me Joshua. Now, the he there is presumably uh, this angel that's providing uh, Zechariah with the vision that he's recording. He showed me Joshua, the high priest. Now, you may say, who's Joshua, the high priest? That's a separate discussion for another time and place standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke, rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? And so there's evidence here that that is the devil's work, Satan's work. Now there's an even easier place to see this sort of thing in action. Go to the book of Job. You remember that book that precedes the book of Psalms. And you will read there, beginning in Job chapter 1, verse 6, There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And Brother John Tatum's uncle, Dr. Clyde Woods, would say that's an improper translation. We should not read Satan came among them, but instead he calls him the Satan. The Satan, because in Hebrew, the word Satan means the adversary. The one who opposes, the one who accuses, the one who slanders. That's the devil's work. What does he do on this occasion? How does he get into the presence of God? 
All of those are good questions, I admit. The Lord said to the Satan, to the adversary, to the enemy, to the opposer, to the accuser, Where do you come from? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. How does he get from place to place? Well, the Bible says he walks. Does today, can he take a car? Can he drive? You know, that he's a spirit being. I don't know. A lot of questions we don't have answered. But it's then that we see his work in practice. Now, amazingly, in this particular incident, God actually brings up Job to Satan. And in response, he says in verse 9, Does Job fear God for nothing? That's an accusation. That's an attempt to accuse. That's an attempt to denigrate, to disparage the character of Job. Job only serves you, God, because you bless him. Take these blessings away and he'll curse you to your face. That's the wager that, if you want to call it that, some people aren't comfortable using that language, but that's basically what it is. That's the wager between God and the evil one. We know that uh, all that Job suffered, uh, he eventually does vindicate God and he is shown to be faithful and righteous despite his suffering. An amazing account, to say the very least. But notice that's what Satan, the devil, the accuser, the adversary, the slanderer, all of those terms apply to him. That's what he did then. Does he do the same today? I have no reason to think that he does not. What that looks like, what that sounds like, I don't know. Some people even ask, does God even do what he, do, uh, what he did uh, for Job in that day? Does he do now? Does he look out either individually and collectively and say to the devil, Have you considered my servants in Crossville? They're faithful to me. The devil says, just watch this. You let me at them. They won't serve you. They'll be unfaithful. They'll turn away. Does God say, go ahead? I don't know. What I do know is this. I do know that he tempts us. Matthew chapter 4, uh, the Son of God was tempted. And uh, according to Hebrews chapter 4, he's tempted, was in all points like as we are, yet without sin. So if Jesus was tempted like we are, then that clearly tells us we'll be tempted just as he was. I would submit his temptation was even more powerful than that which we will face, but temptation is nevertheless the work of the evil one in addition to this false accusation. Further, we know in John 8, that Jesus said the devil was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. He lied to Eve. She believed that lie. Consequently, it resulted in her death and that of Adam. Spiritual death, separation from God. The devil keeps lying, continues to lie every day. Whether it's he personally or those that, if you will, work with him and work for him, uh, maybe all are included in that. But we know it results in our separation from God through sin. And if unremitted, it will result in our eternal death. His influence is probably more than we know. I don't say that again to scare you. I say that only to help you understand that we have to be serious about resisting him. That's what Paul tells us. Resist him firm in your faith. Can he overpower you? He most certainly cannot. Please hear this as we close. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. God's word assures us there is no temptation that has taken us, but such as is common to man. Now, when we hear that word common, that sometimes leads people to conclude we're all tempted the same way. That's not what the verse means at all. I'm tempted in ways that you are not. You're tempted in ways that I am not. Things that appeal to me, that are temptations to me, you would laugh off and say, you should never be tempted by that. I'd probably do the same thing to you. The idea of common is the devil tempts us all. That's the common lot of living in this world where sin and his reign still remain in some effect. But, Paul says, God will with a temptation make a way of escape that you may be able to bear up under it. Every temptation, if I look for it, God will provide me a way to escape it. The problem that I have is probably the same problem you have. Sometimes the temporary pleasure offered by sin. Sometimes just the self-will and pride offered by sin. Sometimes just, again, making myself God instead of letting God be God causes me to disobey and transgress His law and His love and break His heart. And I give in to that temptation. First John chapter 4, we'll leave you with this. John says, Beloved, believe not every spirit. Test the spirits whether they are from God. Many false prophets have gone out into the world. This you know, the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is God. Every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now in the world. That's a lot of question about that. I know you're going over that on Wednesday night. So listen then, and we'll leave it to your class for that purpose. 
But here's the key thing I want you to focus on in verse 4. John writes with confidence, You are of God, little children. You have overcome them, evil spirits. You've overcome the devil and his workers, his minions. Why? Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. There's no struggle. There's no un uncertainty or doubt as to who will win. God is for us, and if we remain with Him, He will give us the victory. Of that, there is no question. Uh, Jesus has appeared. I love Hebrews 2, verse 14. If you want to write just one verse down uh, as the ending. The Hebrew writer says, Jesus has appeared that He might destroy the works of the devil, even death. He tasted death for everyone. And the only thing that the devil had that he could hold over us to intimidate us, to cause us to be fearful, to cause us to quit or to give up, uh, Jesus destroyed. And He took the devil's, if you want to say, best shot on the cross. And on Friday, He was laid in a tomb and the devil said, The victory is mine. Sunday morning, the tomb was empty. Jesus had won. And through Him, as our Savior, we can win and we'll be victorious as well. So those who submit, follow, obey, and trust Him are also assured of victory with Jesus. So is Revelation 12, verse 10 referring to Satan? Yes, because he accuses us. Uh, 1 John 2, uh, I, I like that passage. And maybe as we close tonight, uh, that's what we should focus on. If you're not a Christian, the devil has you right where he wants you. Can I say it that plainly tonight? That should be a, a little bit of a wake-up call. Maybe we need to be more blunt with people. Some people just say, well, you know, I'm not into that God stuff, that Jesus stuff, if you want to call it that. The Bible, I'm not really interested in that. I'm just going to try to remain neutral. I'm not for God. I'm not for Jesus, but I'm not for the devil. I'm just that kind of good person somewhere in the middle of the road. That person doesn't exist. That state does not exist. Jesus said, you're either for me or you're against me. It's cut and dried. It's black and white. So tonight, if you're not a Christian, take these steps outlined in the New Testament to become a Christian. To let Jesus give you the victory through His death, burial, and resurrection. You reenact the same in your obedience to Him, dying to sin, being buried in water, being raised to walk in newness of life. And that power of sin will be broken in your life, and the devil will have no claim over you. Now, for those of us who have, of course, become His children, 1 John 2 verse 1 makes this interesting statement. He said, if anyone sins... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I don't know how much the people of the ancient world had in common with ours, especially as it relates to the legal justice system. Uh, those that are more familiar with that could speak to that better than I can. But today, what do we see? And maybe it's been influenced a lot by TV and books and movies. You see someone accused of a crime and they're brought before the judge. And there's a prosecutor, there's an accuser there, maybe on behalf of the state if there's a law that has been broken. And the case is laid out. But then there's a defense attorney, and some of those guys are very popular. Some recently departed Johnny Cochran, for instance, who tried to get you to escape penalty, even though you may be guilty. This isn't what we're talking about here, but at least it gives us maybe a picture in our mind. When I sin, what can the devil do? He can say to God the Father, He's guilty. And you know what? He's right. Satan can say in the court of heaven, Alan's guilty. He's a sinner. He deserves death and hell with me for all eternity. And the judge reviewing the case would have to say, you know, you're right. That's right. He is guilty. But 1 John 2 verse 1 says, I have an advocate. The word means literally one who stands by your side, a parakletos. I have one that stands by my side, Jesus Christ the righteous. And verse 2 says, He's the propitiation for my sin. So when the devil makes that accusation, Jesus says, Wait a minute, Your Honor, Judge, if you will, my Father, you're right. He's guilty, but I took care of that. Remember? I took care of that. I died for his sins. I paid the pr price for those sins. The punishment he deserved, I've already taken care of that. Again, the Judge of Heaven will say, You're right. He's justified. He's forgiven. And one day, when all is said and done, He will, I will be, you will be saved. Isn't that a wonderful thought? A wonderful way in which we end this lesson tonight. Asking you, do you have that advocate with the Father? Maybe it's because of sin that uh, you need Him to stand by your side tonight. You need to seek His forgiveness by confessing your sins, as verse 9 of the previous chapter said, and knowing that He will cleanse you from those sins. Tonight, if we can help you, we beg you to allow us that opportunity. If you'll come... 
while we stand and sing together.